Was Christopher Columbus a celebrated explorer or a harbinger of suffering? The arrival of his fleets in Hispaniola, Jamaica, and Cuba coincided with a period of immense harm to the native populations. The rise of diseases, widespread mistreatment, and an overwhelming subjugation followed Christopher Columbus's great discovery. Enslavement, ghastly physical punishment, pillaging of gold, and chilling enforcement of Christianity all happened under Columbus's watch. Join us today as we dive into the dark side of Columbus's story and how his arrival brought atrocity to the indigenous people of the Americas. Welcome to History on Fleet. Setting sail from Palo, Spain, Columbus would begin an expedition to find a viable sea passage to the east, holding promises of gold and spice across Asia, India, and China. Discovering a route across the sea was invaluable, and Columbus wanted to be its harbinger. Famously, he would command three ships on his journey, the Santa Maria, the Pinta, and the Niña. The Santa Maria was the largest and captained by Juan de la Cosa. The two smaller caravels were captained by the Pinzon brothers. All three departed from Palos de la Frontera on August 3, 1492 in the evening. After a brief stop in the Canary Islands for restocking in early September, Columbus and his ship set sail for five long weeks. Come the 7th of October, the Pinzon brothers sighted land and soon Columbus changed the course of the fleet to head west. On October 12th, Columbus and his fleet came ashore on what Columbus would call San Salvador, now the Bahamas. Being Columbus and this being the peak of colonial times, he then casually claimed the land he walked on for Spain. His diary entries upon discovering the native inhabitants of the Bahamas are riddled with alarming superiority and dim view of cultures beyond his own. In his journal, Columbus wrote that native people would make for good servants. He would also refer to them as Indians. It's believed Columbus encountered the Arawak, Taino, and Lucayan peoples. Yet symptomatic of his superior cultural worldview, upon seeing the gold in their earwear, he imprisoned several Arawak and demanded they take him to their source of gold. Columbus's view of the native peoples was so diminished, he didn't even set up a fortified outpost and would declare in his journal that he could conquer them all with 50 men. This was just the first stop on Columbus's voyage and his discovery of the New World. Exploitation and Enslavement What's curious about the initial encounters of Columbus's voyage was the extent to which he was, understandably, oblivious or lost. In late October, his fleet would arrive on the northeastern coast of Cuba, which Columbus believed to be the Chinese mainland. Across the following two months through November and into December, Columbus's fleet would make expeditions across the Caribbean in search of gold. The Pinta was searching for an island, Babek, on the natives stating it was abundant in gold. Columbus himself landed on the northern coast of Hispaniola in early December. Once again, he believed that this may have been Japan. This initial voyage would continue into the Bay of Rincon, where finally Columbus was met with resistance. When a trade of bows and arrows went away, a battle ensued, leaving Ciguayo natives stabbed and wounded with arrows. It should come as no surprise that Columbus's expedition was not warmly received by every last native population of the Americas. He was taking captives from these islands as he traveled. Having set up a minor colony of 39 men from his fleet on Hispaniola, Columbus would return to Spain the following year in March 1493 to the highest possible decoration from the Spanish court. Not since Leif Erikson, some four centuries prior, had a European explored the Americas. Yet Columbus's story has a dark underbelly. He returned to Spain with gold, spices, and people. His following three expeditions would discover further Caribbean islands, the Gulf of Mexico and the South and Central American mainland. These voyages would also set a grim pattern of enslaving natives and forcing labor from indigenous persons. During his second voyage in 1494, Columbus explored Cuba and Jamaica, where he would implement the Spanish labor system, Encomienda. This brutal system meant conquerors were owed the labor of non-Christian persons. Under Encomienda, the treatment of indigenous people was staggeringly inhumane. Dismemberment was a punishment. Execution was dished out for minor crimes. Children were not spared from forced labor and physical and sexual punishment were a provincial reality for many adult natives. All in the name of finding gold, inhumane treatment was entirely normalized and thousands of native people took their own lives rather than being oppressed. On his return to Spain after his second voyage, Columbus would return with over 500 enslaved Arawak natives. Some 200 would not survive the journey. This was only the second voyage of four. Columbus and his historic discoveries would go on, and his effect on native populations would remain toxic. Barbaric Governance and Dire Depopulation In 1498, Columbus departed from Sanlúcar, Spain, 
for his third voyage to the Americas. His colony on Hispaniola had grown to such a fixture, it became something of an infamous matter. In August, Columbus would return to find the settlers he'd left in the newfound land in revolt against his rule. In response, Columbus had them tried, and at least one settler was hung for the insolence. The Spanish court would discover the realities of Columbus's rule on Hispaniola, which was openly described as tyranny. Francisco de Bobadilla was sent by the crown to investigate the conditions of Columbus's rule. What Bobadilla discovered was a landscape of misery and brutality. Columbus would have individuals' facial features and extremities cut off as punishment before selling them into the slave trade. Any native revolt was quelled through murder, then displaying dismembered bodies in the streets to ward off any further attempts. Those who spoke against Columbus's rule on Hispaniola would expect to have their tongues cut off. That all being said, it's keen to note the lack of neutrality from the source of these accusations. Bobadilla was regarded as wanting Columbus's position as ruler of Hispaniola, and an anti-Italian sentiment from the Spanish had been considered by many historians. It should also be noted, though, that Columbus and his brother were put in chains and put in jail for six weeks in Spain over these accusations. What is not open for debate is the emergence of disease that arose with the arrival of Columbus's fleet across the Americas. Following his exploration of Jamaica and Cuba, Columbus would return to Hispaniola in 1949 only to find that two-thirds of his settlers had died of disease and famine. That was just his population of chosen settlers. The mortality rate of native persons following the arrival of settlers was markedly more severe. The exchange of plants, goods, and animals from Columbus's voyages is a flashpoint for introducing novel diseases to the Americas. Indigenous societies in the New World had no immunity to Old World diseases like influenza, smallpox, or measles. According to the Oklahoma Medical Research Foundation, over a 25-year period, the indigenous people of Hispaniola faced an over 90% death rate. That's a population of around 250,000 people in 1492, reduced to only 14,000 by 1517. Many historians place this population decline as understandably seismic, believing the impact of new diseases in the New World to be deadlier than the Black Death in medieval Europe. Columbus would be a trendsetter for colonizing across the Americas and biological warfare, with the British following suit centuries later, handing smallpox-laced blankets to the Shawnee and Lenape in the 1760s. A Colonized Christianity A curious and much-overlooked strand of Columbus's narrative is the less-than-noble forced conversion to Christianity he brought to indigenous people in the New World. Columbus was something of a Catholic fundamentalist, for want of a better term. In his writings to King Ferdinand II, Columbus would write with vigor on his sense of mission bringing Catholicism to the New World. An unimaginable detail in today's eyes, but in a middle period of pervading Catholicism across the continent of Europe, Pope Alexander VI issued a decree declaring the discovered New World to the Spanish monarchy in 1493. Yet this is where the horror would begin. Under papal decree, Spanish conquerors were able to destroy any cultural and spiritual practice of the indigenous people of the Americas. Under an ultimatum known as the Requirement, from 1514, Spanish conquerors would warn the native people to convert to Catholicism or else. The threat included the taking of wives and children, making slaves of them, and the warning to do damage and harm in any way possible. As you may be thinking, how did the native people of the Americas understand this dictum in Spanish? Well, they didn't, and there was no translation offered. This dictum would be read sometimes from ships, even before the Spanish crew had set foot on the New World. Legacy, Reckoning, and Revision What can be said of the legacy of Columbus? It's certain to say that we would not have the Americas today without his incredible pioneering and discovery. What also can be said is the methodology and means of Columbus's discovery have been severely glossed over by the mainstream narrative. Columbus indeed discovered the Americas by chance, and what was meant to be the definition of a shipping route east turned into something completely different. So often, Columbus has been characterized as a founder of the New World. The truth is that the world long existed, and Columbus was more a plunderer than a discoverer. Though he can't be individually outlined for being a rabid colonialist in an era dominated and defined by them, but neither can he be defined when his exploits on the continent were predominantly based on harvesting gold and subjugating native populations. In the present, the celebration of Columbus Day, a federal holiday since 1971 in America, has proven controversial. America has long celebrated its pioneer spirit, and Columbus has been a symbol of this. Though in so many eyes, 
This needs serious revision. How much was Columbus a pioneer for stumbling upon the land in hopes of discovering a trade route? How much can a bold expedition be celebrated if its overwhelming result was the decimation of entire populations? Perhaps more pertinently, Columbus's treatment of Native Americans would shape the treatment to come with the British colonizers in the centuries to come. These were people not viewed as inhabitants and protectors of their land, they were viewed as obstacles to be removed. It's curious to note that Columbus himself did not come to the end of his life detailing himself as some hero. Writing only days before his death, Columbus regarded himself in a letter as such, I ought to be judged as a captive, who for such a long time up to this day has borne arms without laying them aside for an hour. This perspective is one of force and militarism not one of open-eyed discovery and celebration. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.